Merci Philippe. À toi, à toi Fadi, quand tu veux. Ah, tout d'abord, je, je, je vais parler un petit peu en français, mais, mais d'abord un petit peu en arabe. Atamana uh, lokum Eid al-Futr Saïd Mubarak, li jamiakum, wa sanat qabila maliatun bil hassanat wa tayyibat. Shukran. Grand merci uh, à vous tous. Chacun, et en particulier et individuellement, et, et vous, vous tous pour ce grand, grand plaisir euh, de vous joindre. Euh, euh, je vais virer à l'anglais pour que tout le monde comprenne ce que je vais dire. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be part of this uh, webinar sponsored by the many people that you see uh, from the Moroccan Society of Neurological Surgery as well as the Society of French-Speaking Neurosurgery and many of the dignitaries. And um, I have the privilege of knowing uh, the individuals on this, uh, on this screen. Uh, and I consider it to be a distinct privilege uh, for many reasons that go back over time and based on personal experience uh, that has been reinforced over the years. I congratulate you for leading Uh, with this technological advances, the future of education uh, via a webinar. Uh, the reason I feel uh, very privileged and pleased to be part of you, uh, because Morocco has a, not only a very special place in my heart, but Morocco uh, is a shining uh, uh, planet, an astro rayonant uh, in the world of, of, of medicine, of neurosurgery, of humanity not only in, in, the, in the Maghreb and Africa, but in the Middle East and around the world. And this is something that becomes more and more evident the more you get to be fortunate enough to visit this country, meet the people, and uh, get to exchange uh, over time and feel it in your skin. Uh, uh, what a wonderful atmosphere exists in this environment. So I am indeed very, very privileged. Uh, And I will uh, circle back to that in a little bit. So uh, I would like to start sharing my screen with you. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Professor Derkawi, uh, to share the screen. Uh, you have to give me permission, please. Right now. Mm -hmm. Can you start? Yes, I will start. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Can you see the screen okay? Yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay, very good. So it is, uh, <clears throat> it is this wonderful seminar that is uh, uh, hosted by the Society of Moroccan Neurosurgery. And um, it is uh, wonderful for me to see that because I have been uh, privileged to be part of this uh, meeting uh, in 2016, as you see here. And during that meeting, uh, which was held in the uh, amazing city of Essaouira, I've had uh, the privilege to encounter many of the things related to Morocco and Moroccan neurosurgery that I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the things that, that were there was the love that uh, this amazing teacher inspired in his students. He was honored in a manner that all of us uh, Uh, the dream to be honored and uh, this is something that I, uh, marked me and uh, and I uh, and I hope that all of us uh, can have this this opportunity not only is he an amazing uh, surgeon educator uh, but a friend uh, the utmost man of hospitality I recall just recently we were visiting with our dean and our dean's wife of the medical school Casablanca and he insisted on very short notice Uh, to meet us uh, personally for the dinner together with Dr. Derkawi, which you see here. So thank you, dear friend, for uh, the kindness that you have showed us over the years. Uh, so many others, of course, La Grande Dame uh, of Neurosurgery, my dear, dear friend, uh, uh, Professor Najia El Abadi, uh, who has pioneered this field in so many ways uh, with, a, uh, with an arc of her career that crossed the continents and leadership here in the Pan-Arab and later worldwide in neurosurgery. And right here, you see the founder 
of neurosurgery, I would venture to say not only in Morocco, but in the Middle East in so many ways, who also crossed the continents, Professor El Kamlishi, uh, also the leader in the World Federation. The first meeting that was held there was in Fez, uh, a meeting that no one can forget. And so many others that are seen here, you see Professor Cornu, uh, uh, Professor El Wahhabi, and are also our host this, our host this year. So I, I, so I, of course, I cannot mention everybody because it will take too long. But all of you uh, have touched me with your friendship, uh, with your honesty, with the ability to say things very straight and very kindly, and, uh, and I treasure that. So today we will talk about bypass and uh, Dr. Derkawi suggested that we send a few uh, pre-talk uh, questions. So if possible, if you could put them up, please, uh, for the younger people in the audience or anybody, a, uh, a questionnaire. So yes. uh, please tell us how to do it, Fad. Just you have to answer. Okay. So anybody you to choose. Can... Well, you have uh, do you have the quiz on your screen? So if okay, so if I answer, nobody sees what I'm saying. No, 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 no. I will uh, show the results by, by the end. Okay. Just, I will give you about, uh, what do you think? 30 seconds or seven questions? Yeah, maybe, maybe one okay. minute. One minute, okay. Let's do uh, it. Maybe, maybe Fadi uh, read the, the, the questions uh, one by okay. one. And, uh, the... I will. So the first question, towards the end of the year 1941, <laughs> the United States entered World War II. The Neuropsychiatric Institute of the University of Illinois was completed, A and B. So three choices. Question number two, bypass are conceptually classified into seven types or two types, or it depends on the patient's age or cannot be classified. Okay, question three. What is the most important driver of vesicle flow in vivo? The radius of the vessel, the length of the vessel, the viscosity of the blood, or the pressure gradient. You can only choose one. The most important driver of vessel flow in vivo. Question number four, what is the cut flow index? It is the bypass flow divided by the cut flow. Is it the cut flow divided by the bypass flow? Is it the number of bypasses a surgeon performs per year? Or is it a mystery? <laughs> Question number five. True or false? Vein grafts are high flow and STA bypass are low flow. True or false? Question number six, another true or false. The most common cause of bypass failure is a technical problem due to a faulty anastomosis suturing. True or false? And this is the bonus question. Question seven. Essawira was called Mogador at one point, was a major Phoenician <laughs> trading post as early as the 12th century before the current era, was the site of Astapor, hometown of the Unsullied in the Game of Thrones series, hosts the world famous Ganawa festival, or all of the above? <laughs> All of you. That's the bonus question. Okay. Okay. Then we go on with the talk. So, uh, so these are the questions. Uh, but since we cannot be there in person, I will thought I'll give you a small overview of where we are right now. I'm speaking with you over the internet with this web conference from the fourth floor of this building somewhere around here, which is the Neuropsychiatric Institute. The Neuropsychiatric Institute 
was completed at the end of 1941, and it was the first of its kind in North America, in the United States, the second in North America, because the first one was the Montreal Neurological Institute. It was built to look like the brain. As you can see here, there's two hemispheres and a corpus callosum. This idea was then uh, used and replicated in a more modern way in another, other places. But this is the original <laughs> brain looking building, Art Deco in 1941. So it was completed at the end of 1941. And at the end of 1941, for many of you that remember history, that was the time when the United States entered World War II. But despite that, the Institute opened because of the strength of its founder, Dr. Eric Olberg, who was the last resident of Harvey Cushing. Eric Olberg was a man of many talents. And this is the operating room log. And you see right here, this is the first surgery performed at the Institute, December 9, 1941, which is a Tuesday. And the first surgery was performed with Dr. Olberg, assisted by Dr. Green. Dr. John Green eventually went to Phoenix, Arizona and founded the Barrow Neurological Institute. You can see the history of neurosurgery, how it's connected. This historical building uh, remains. On the seventh floor is the operating room, as it used to look like in the early 1940s, with an epilepsy surgery being performed there. This is what it looks like now. And recently, we had the distinct pleasure of hosting Professor El Abadi and Dean Ben Omar, who came and visited us. And Dr. Professor El Abadi gave us fantastic talks on the humanitarian aspects of neurosurgery, which she carried around the world, as well as technical talks on minimally invasive neurosurgery in Morocco around the world. And you see her here uh, with our Dean at the time, Professor Charles Ray. On the seventh floor of our institute, which used to be the operating room, but now is a conference room connected live with the operating room, similar to what you see happening today. So that is indeed the future. Dr. Olberg remained the head of the institute for 30 years, a long time which allowed him to really build this place. He was succeeded by Dr. Sugar, then Dr. Robert Kroll from the East Coast, and then in 91 by my mentor, Dr. James Ausman, a dashing figure, superb surgeon, and a real uh, leader. I had the great fortune of coming with him from Detroit and I stayed with him for 17 years during residency and afterwards until he retired in 2001. And I've been the chair here since that time. This is what the Institute looks like in a day like today. It's a beautiful day today in Chicago, sun is up, and this is our Institute from the front view of it. And our Institute, you can see it is here now from an aerial view but it is part of a very large campus of the University of Illinois in Chicago. The University of Illinois in Chicago is the largest medical school in the US and the campus is a very large campus. It goes from behind this line all the way, if you can see my arrow, to there. And one key feature of this university is it has a very strong engineering school. And the engineering school is a short distance and in our research buildings, we share space with the engineering school. I do share space with them and I've worked with the engineers nonstop for all those years. And this has been extremely fulfilling from the research and development perspective. And we worked on many uh, uh, devices and diagnostic abilities and computational modeling all related to the vascular sphere. And because of this work with engineering at the university and elsewhere, uh, we developed ways and technologies to measure blood flow, which have been instrumental in helping our understanding and when to treat, what to treat, and to monitor the effect of the treatment. And of course, we'll talk more about that. So let's start with the most important question. In life, 
in everything, the most important question, of course, is why. Why do we do a bypass? I mean, why do the surgery? Uh, it's a technically demanding surgery. It's a beautiful surgery. It uh, requires precision. But other than the technical aspect of it, why do we really do it? What is the reason? Well, after thinking about it for many years and truly from measuring flow, it became evident that there are only two reasons for which we perform the surgery and two reasons only. The first reason is the classic bypass, which was pioneered by Yasser Gil, which is a bypass done to augment flow in the context of brain ischemia. So this would be similar to the brain being starved from blood like the sand in this desert where there is no water and you need to increase the blood flow because there's a baseline flow deficiency. So the bypass augments the flow. The other type of bypass, which comes later, is a flow replacement bypass. And what do I mean by that? A flow replacement is a bypass that is performed only to replace or correct a deficit of flow that is introduced because of our treatment, commonly done now for aneurysms. So for example, a giant aneurysm, complex aneurysm, the treatment of which requires sacrifice of some vessels on purpose or by accident, would then be the situation where we would perform a bypass to correct this deficit of flow, to replace this deficit of flow, which we cause because of our surgery. So that's the answer to question number two. There's two types of bypasses. Now we talked about flow and we talked about why we perform the bypass. So we want flow to either augment or be preserved. But what actually drives the flow? We have to think about this. Why does flow go into the vessel from point A to point B? Why does the blood move from point A to point B? Why not the other way around, for example? Well, everybody's familiar with this equation. This is the Poiseuille equation, where it postulates that flow, Q, is a function of a pressure gradient, a difference in pressure between A and B, delta P, the radius, the rayon, to the power of four of the vessel, the length of the vessel, so the longer the vessel, less the flow, and the viscosity. More viscosity, less flow. You all know that. Honey flows more slowly than water. OK. So which one is the most important determinant of flow in vivo? Is it the radius? Most people would say the radius. And I used to think that. It kind of makes sense intuitively because it's to the power of four. However, that is not the most important driver of flow in vessels in vivo. And I will show you why with many, many examples in a little bit. That's not it. How about the length? Yes. I mean, if you shorten the vessel, you get more flow. How about viscosity? Yeah. I mean, if you hemodilute the patient, we all know hemodilution helps flow, but that's not something that happens commonly during a bypass surgery. We cannot change the radius of the bypass during bypass surgery either. So it's not really that important. So what is the really most important driver of flow? Delta P. Very, very important. And once you understand that and you apply it, your bypasses will be a lot more successful. Delta P is the driver of flow in vivo. All right, so we talked a lot about flow. How do we measure flow? How do we know what the flow is? Quantitative measure of flow can be achieved in two ways. We can measure flow at surgery with a ultrasound flow probe, or we can measure flow around surgery perioperatively with the NOVA software, which is MRI, non-invasive flow measurement. Intraoperatively, the measurement of flow allows us to know exactly quantitatively what flow is, not velocity. 
And there's a very big difference. And it's repeatable, and we can do it as many times as we want. And for those of us around the world that use this technology, we have learned many important lessons. Maybe the first one is that angiographic patency does not correlate with flow. So if one does an angiogram at surgery, uh, DSA or ICG, we can say, look, the vessel is flowing, it is patent, but we cannot say how much it is flowing. It could be very little, it could be a lot. The velocity, very importantly, velocity is a Doppler, which is also used commonly, but it is not quantitative. And you have to be very careful with Doppler because the velocity will increase with the stenosis. If you narrow a vessel, the velocity increases. So it can be very misleading. The flow is a real number. The diameter does not correlate with flow. The pulse does not correlate with flow. A great pulse could indicate an obstruction with the reflectance of the waveform and the pulse wave. And that is why sometimes a bypass which will fail has actually a great pulse for a while, and then it will occlude. So that's intraoperatively. Perioperatively, this is the Nova software. It is a quantitative way to measure blood flow in blood vessels. We get the direction of the flow. We get the number of the flow and we see which vessels we are measuring, and that allow us to decide which patients to operate on or to follow and the quality and the frequency of the follow-up. So these are the two ways flow can be measured quantitatively in blood vessels. Okay, we've talked about all that now. We led the stage. We're getting close to surgery. What is the cut flow? Cut flow is that, the cut flow. You take a vessel, a small vessel, like the STA, which we use routinely, and you cut it. And once you cut it, you measure the flow in that vessel. Now, if you think about it, you know that once you cut it, the distal has no resistance. The resistance is zero. So that means, and we said the pressure is what drives the flow. That means the cut flow is the maximal carrying capacity of that vessel. This is how you know how much that vessel can provide in terms of flow. So it's the first thing to do before doing the bypass. How much can that donor provide? And as you can see here from a publication now from 2005, we've updated now with hundreds and thousands of measurements that the STA cut flow can range from anywhere from a very low flow, eight cc's to very high flow. I've had STAs that have had flows of over 250 cc. So that gets you to the answer to the other question, low flow versus high flow. An STA can be anything. On average, an STA provides about 68, 70 cc's of flow, a healthy STA. This is not low flow, this is, what it is. So the flow in the STA is not low flow, high flow, middle flow. It is what it is if you measure it. And that's the flow in that vessel or in any vessel for that matter. So what is the cut flow index? The cut flow index then is a very simple thing that you can do after you finish the bypass. You've measured the cut flow. Let's say the STA can give 100 cc's. Then you perform your bypass, you did it a very nice job, you measure the flow in the bypass, and it's also 100 cc's. If you divide the bypass flow by the cut flow, that's the index. So that means this bypass is flowing at 100%. The index is one. So that is the cut flow index. The cut flow index gives you a composite, a composite of how well this procedure went. If the indication is good, the anastomosis is good, the recipient is good, the suture line was good, everything went well, the index will be very close to one. If it's low, if it's less than 50%, you have to ask yourself why. For example, the same bypass, cut flow is 100, you do the anastomosis, you think everything went well, and you have a flow of 20. Hmm. What does that mean? Is it the same thing as if 
the cut flow was 20 and the bypass was 20. Of course not. Because the first one is a 20% bypass. The second one is 100% bypass. So the flow alone gives you an indication. But if you look at the index, it tells you, hmm, why is it that if a bypass can give 100, am I only getting 20? That may be good, that may be bad, but it prompts you to interrogate. Generally speaking, though, if a bypass is less than 50%, it's significantly, uh, uh, it's a significant harbinger of, of occlusion. So if it's a low cut flow, it's a harbinger of occlusion, early versus late occlusion. And, and so it's an important number to, to measure and keep in mind. Okay, so we've talked about all those things and now we're getting to this very interesting topic that people debate a lot of times in meetings. Bypass conduit. Which bypass conduit should we use? And of course, you've heard the conversations. Not so much anymore because people now are getting it. But people say low flow, and then they say associate with that STA or occipital artery. And then they say high flow, and they associate with that radial artery or a vein graft. And why do they do that? Because they confuse terminology. They confuse the name of the conduit, a vein or an artery, the diameter of the conduit, whatever the diameter is, with its carrying capacity. They assume that a large vessel will carry a lot of flow. They assume that a low vessel will carry little flow. At an extreme, that could be true. But in vivo, you will see that that can be very, very misleading. So that is not a precise way to use the words. We have to be precise and accurate. So if we say low flow, high flow, there's no guarantee that a vein graft will give high flow, and there's no guarantee that an STA will be low flow. And I will explain with more examples. And the corollary of this conversation is this. Why not? If we can just use a vein graft and carry as much flow as it will carry, let's just use a vein graft or a radial artery and use it every time in every case, and that solves it. Why do we have to think? Why think? Well, this is why. Because there's an, a number that's called the wall shear stress. The wall shear stress is a constant, is a constant. It's a constant that actually exists across species from man to animal. What is it? The wall shear stress is a ratio between the flow in a vessel and the diameter of the vessel. I'll explain. If the flow increases in a vessel, the diameter of the vessel will increase. And as a result, the wall shear stress will return to the same number, which is around 10 dyne per second centimeter square. It is a constant. And it has to do with a lot of physiology at the wall and a lot of complicated uh, biodynamic, hemodynamic, and interaction between the fluid and the wall. But simply, the wall shear stress will try to remain constant. This is why, for example, you all see the ABMs, the veins are very large. If you remove the ABM, the veins shrink. Why? Because of the wall shear stress. <clears throat> so the wall shear stress will cause the vessel to remodel itself. And the perfect demonstration of why you cannot just use the largest vessel you can find willy-nilly is this paper by Bart van der Svan and the Tulikin group, Professor Case Tulikin, who developed Elana. Elana is a large diameter bypass. It's more than two and a half, 2.7 millimeters, but they measured flow. And what did they find? Even though is a large diameter vessel, a vein, the flow is very variable. And more importantly, in a large vessel like this, if the flow is low, less than 40 cc's per minute, that vessel will occlude. Why will it occlude? Wall tree stress. So this vessel will try to shrink. It cannot shrink. It will thrombose and it will occlude. So that is the answer why you just have to tailor the vessel to the flow needed and not use any vessel all the time. And we know that because we measured flow. 
Here's how the Walsh stress works. At two days, this is the size of the superficial temporal artery, and the flow is 70 cc's. At one year, the size of the vessel is larger. Why? Because the flow increased. It's now 82. And at four years, it is stable, 87. Here's the flow being measured. And I follow, we follow our patients forever. And that's an advantage of staying in the same place for a long time. I've been in Chicago for 25, 27 years. And over time, you like to see the vessel mature, the bypass flow remains stable over time. But it's not always the case. Here's the same type of surgery in the STA MCA bypass. The flow initially was 79, the carotid was occluded at follow up. The flow decreased to 37. Consequently, the bypass shrunk and eventually it occluded. Why? Because there is a reciprocal relationship to demand and supply. And I'm, I'm gonna circle back to that progressively to remind you of this Delta P. So why do bypasses fail? That's one of the questions. Why do bypasses fail? I will concentrate on the so-called type one and type two C. But generally speaking, bypass fail for one or two general categories, big categories. Type one, there's no indication. And I'll circle back to that in the next slide. Type two is a technical. And when it comes to technical, the most common reason a bypass fail is a technical problem at the anastomosis, which is typically catching the back wall or the other wall with the suture. So that's why it's a very, very important to practice the surgery, to inspect the suture line regularly, and to make absolutely sure, especially at the APCs, at the toe and the heel, that the suture does not catch the back wall of the vessel. So type one, what is type one? Type one problem means you perform a bypass, but there's no demand. Here's this man who has bilateral vertebral artery occlusion. The flow to the posterior circulation is coming through a very large posterior communicating artery. And we thought he needed a bypass. This was a long time ago before we could measure flow with the MR. So before surgery, we had no idea what the flow was. All we had was the angiogram. So we thought he needed surgery. We took him to surgery to perform a flow augmentation bypass from the STA in red to the SCA superior cerebellar artery in blue. This is the recording of flow continuously during the whole surgery. The donor in red, the recipient in blue. And you can see that the superficial temporal artery here, the flow in it is very low. I am measuring flow in this vessel right here while it's still in the scalp. And that's the flow in the STA in the scalp. It is very low. It's always less than 10 cc's. Why? Because there's a lot of resistance in the scalp. Now, look at this. We cut the vessel right here. And in instant, the flow went from about four cc's to 65, 66 cc's. It increased, it increased by about 15 times. In an instant, the same exact vessel. Did the diameter change? No. What changed? The pressure gradient. Before that, the pressure here was very high, and here the pressure is zero. Boom, the vessel flows. This is why, for example, if you conclude the carotid, the posterior communicating artery flows, or the ACOM. You create a demand, the vessel flow. There is no demand, the vessel does not flow. So we continue with the surgery, we clamp everything, and I perform the bypass. Actually, my boss performed the bypass, Dr. Ausman. I was assisting him here. And we measure flow again. And look what happened. First, let me ask you this question. Here's the flow and the SCA before and after the bypass. This is a bypass for ischemia, flow augmentation bypass. Was there any flow augmentation? You see any increase in the flow before and after the bypass in that SCA? None, correct? None whatsoever. Why? 
Well, because of this, the PICA. This patient already had a bypass and a very good one. This is a very large PCOM, probably three millimeter, four millimeter PCOM. Did not need the surgery. We did not know that. So no flow augmentation. And what is the index? The bypass flow is about five. The STA cut flow is about 65. This bypass is less than 8%. Type one problem. Technically, it's good. The anastomosis is perfect. Dr. Osman is a superb surgeon. Very good job, but was not needed. And now we learn. And this is how we learn over time, by measuring, by documenting, and by thinking about it. Type one problem. So where else does it happen most commonly today? Not anymore for flow augmentation because have ways to measure flow before surgery, and we can be absolutely sure a patient that we need to know about because it pertains to a very common scenario, bypass for moya moya. This is an excellent bypass. A large STA, good filling, the cut flow is 150. Again, an STA can provide a lot of flow and an index of almost 98%. How about here? A very nice STA, patent anastomosis, angiogram looks good, but the index is only 27%. What is the difference between these two? One is able to go everywhere, and here the flow is restricted. Why is it restricted? Moya moya. Moya moya is a very difficult problem because the vascular beds, the territories do not communicate. So you can put a bypass here, but the M1 is occluded and it will stay here. It cannot go everywhere else. <clears throat> So there has to be a different strategy for revascularizing moya moya compared to a carotid occlusion. And this is the evolution of my strategies over time. And we culminated with this single vessel double anastomosis, which is my preferred way of doing it. And I'll show you why as we progress this. But the principles of uh, bypass for moya moya is guided by the fact that it's a progressive disease. The way the vessels look today are not going to be the way they're going to look in four or five years. We all know the Suzuki classification. It's a progressive disease, number one. Number two, you can do a very good bypass. It looks great today, but over time, a good number of them involute, they shrink. So you want to do a direct bypass because all the data say that direct bypass is better than indirect bypass in adults. And we want to revascularize as many compartments as needed because they don't communicate. We want to optimize for an index close to one. We want to use as little vessels as possible, so for salvage, so we can use them later if needed. Of course, we want to have the least amount of trauma, but we don't want to put too much flow, no more than 80 to 100 cc's. So here's over time how this has evolved. A Moya Moya patient, very low flow. Look at the MCA flow 56 versus 231 on the right. And the cut flow, of the trunk of the STA is 41. I do the first anastomosis here, looks good on the ICG, but the index is only 58%. Why? 2C. If you put a bypass here, the flow will only go here. It will not go here and go everywhere. So I do another bypass to this area. Adds another 20 cc's, and now we have an index of one. In other words, we are taking advantage of all that this vessel can give. We're not wasting anything. And that is the Nova flow. You can see the flow in the STA trunk, 95 cc's, one anastomosis, second anastomosis. This is the so-called double barrel anastomosis. Here's another patient. This is a hemorrhagic moya moya. And the same thing, double barrel anastomosis. And you can see the angiogram, one anastomosis here, one here, a lot of filling takes care of both territories. You see the Nova flow measurements, excellent flow. Here's another one. So I did that for a long time. It's a certainly a good way to do it. It provides a lot of flow, double barrel bypass. What is the downside? The downside is that you are using all the vessels all at once. And since it is a progressive disease and the bypass can involute, what happens if it does? What do you have left? You have spent all your money. 
at once, the first time. I'll show you an example. How do we know that? Well, we know that because we measured flow in bypasses over time. And in this cohort, relatively small cohort, we were shocked to find that if you follow Moya Moya patients over time, a good number of them, in fact, about two thirds of them, the bypass will involute over time. So, and in fact, if you follow the patients carefully, this bypass does not stay patent forever in a good portion of the patients. And I do, I do, I follow all my patients. So here's a series of bypasses at one day, 96% are patent. At one year, only 74% are patent. So because of that, now we know that we want to be able to perform this bypass in a manner that allow us to maximize to maximize uh, the benefit of the bypass, but not use everything all at once. So how can we do that? As I evolved in my think thinking, I started to do this. Double barrel still using both branches, a direct bypass here and, and direct also here, side to side, end to side here, side to side here, but leaving the vessel in continuity in an EDAS. So it's at the same time, a direct bypass, and an EDAS, direct bypass here and EDAS here, with also a double bypass at the same time. So it's another way to do it, but we can do better. Better means use less vessels. So one day I had this patient that come in with a carotid occlusion, and I wanted to do a double barrel bypass, but the branches are very far apart. One is here and one is here. I didn't want to do a huge flap for him. So I thought, okay, I'll just use this branch. Here it is at surgery. I check it. The cut flow is 117 cc's. I says, wow, that's a very good bypass. How about I try this? So I did a first anastomosis and it was a side to side anastomosis in one territory below the sylvian fissure, check the flow in it. It was only 67 cc's. So I continued and performed the second anastomosis above the sylvian fissure, end to side, and it provided another 40 cc's. And that was consequently 110 cc bypass and a cut flow index of one. So this is where I started to think that this would be a very good thing to use for Moya Moya, a single vessel, double anastomosis. You see side to side, end to side, single vessel. And then we showed it, we published it, the first one in 2015 in Berlin. And then we used it many times afterwards. And this is other example. This is someone with a very high flow collateral through the ophthalmic artery, through the MMA. And this young lady was having vision problems. So we needed to do the bypass, but to reduce the flow at the same time. So you see the anterior branch, the posterior branch in continuity. And with the anterior branch, <clears throat> I did a side to side and end to side. So single vessel double anastomosis. And the posterior branch is an EDAS. And consequently, the flow in the bypass is very high, 167. But the flow in the MMA reduced. It went from 90 to 40. And her vision improved because she was diabetic. She had diabetic uh, proliferative, proliferative retinopathy and by creating a better way for the blood to get to her brain, the flow through her ophthalmic artery decreased and that helped her tremendously. Another example here, you see the Moya Moya, two vessels, one and the other, or isolating one of the branches. The cut flow is 115, but the branches are 65 and 61. This is not bad. If you can get 60, 70 cc's of flow in a bypass, this is pretty good. So I did the first anastomosis, which you see being performed here.
And then very careful. Remember, we talked about catching the back wall. So I'm inspecting, making sure I did not catch the back wall. And we progress, completing the anastomosis. And once one side is finished, we look at the other side, and here the anastomosis is complete. Looks good. I check the flow before doing the other anastomosis. And once I did that, I found that the flow in this graft was actually excellent. So why do a direct bypass here and risk it occluding also over time? So I re anastomosed this branch and kept it as an EDAS because there was already sufficient flow. It's re anastomosed here. I kept it as an EDAS. And I would like you to see what happens. The flow in this vessel is going forward 71 cc's, the direct bypass. And watch the flow in this vessel is going backwards from the scalp into the brain. Why? Pressure gradient. There's low resistance here, high resistance here, and the flow will go from high resistance to low resistance. So direct bypass flowing integrate and the indirect bypass is flowing from the scalp backward into the direct bypass. And here is the angiogram. Here's the direct bypass filling. And here's the parietal branch, which I re anastomosed, which is in continuity, which will give us safety in the future. Flow being measured in the direct bypass, 122 cc's. In the indirect bypass, 19 cc's. So, this is uh, the evolution of where we are with this. Uh, there's a newer way that I'm doing it now. And uh, here, as you can see, the parietal branch being uh, harvested, the craniotomy is being done. Uh, the cut flow in this little branch, so that's the main trunk. The cut flow in this little branch is 30 cc's. So we're going to prepare this vessel, going to clean it really well. We're going to place some uh, sutures at the apices. So it's really important to clean the vessel very nicely. Suture at the apices. And then check the flow in the recipient. Very little flow. Temporary clipping. Opening the vessel with the apex blade. It's a very sharp blade. Flushing the lumen with heparinized saline. And then you can see here there's a very little tag that I'm cleaning. Very important to make sure nothing goes into the anastomosis. So the suture is being placed on one side and on another. We're going to proceed with, with the anastomosis progressively. And here's the flow in the anastomosis is 35 cc. So what do we have here is one branch a direct bypass and an EDAS at the same time through a relatively small incision. And look at the ICG. Here's the flow in the direct bypass, and here's the flow in the EDAS. Low resistance, high resistance. And here is the Nova, which looks really very helpful. That's the STA trunk. You can see the flow. It's anti-grade. The flow is measured here. It's anti-grade. That's the STA and the posterior branch, and that's the direct bypass here. 129 cc's in the trunk, 97 cc's in the bypass. You see how it's going directly into the brain. And in the distal STA, the EDAS part, it is only six cc's. And it flows with high resistance, and it reaches the zero line every single time. So this is a complex system. Whatever we do can introduce consequences that we know more and more over time because of experience and because of measurement.
I don't need to remind anyone that this surgery has been around now for more than 50 years. Professor Yasser Gil, Professor Donahue pioneered it. Two studies have shown to be most shareable that the surgery for ischemia maybe doesn't work. We can say it worked. We cannot say it doesn't work. But that's the most charitable way to say it. But we still do it. It's being done. Most young trainees want to do it. Everybody aspires to the surgery. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons. It's a difficult surgery. It's like a peak that once wants to climb. You challenge yourself to do it. It's aesthetically one of the most beautiful surgery anyone can do. And probably to paraphrase Voltaire, if it didn't exist, il aurait fallu l'inventer. So we have it. We have talked about all those things. We talked about why perform a bypass. There's really two reasons, either to augment flow or preserve flow. We talked about the fact that the determinant of flow in vivo is the pressure gradient, the pressure gradient. That it is really important to measure flow quantitatively, and I showed you how we can do it with the intraoperative ultrasound and de novo perioperative. We talked about the cut flow index and how important it is in informing us about if we did the bypass for the proper reason and if the bypass is functioning as well as it could. We talked about the choice of the conduit and to avoid the mistake of confusing the size of the conduit with its carrying capacity and the flow in it. And we showed in detail examples of failure from type one, which is lack of demand, and type 2C, which is moya moya, which is non-communicating beds. So now we go to the bonus question. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, here is the five choices. Essawira. Essawira. Essawira at one point was indeed called Mogador. It was called by Mogador by the Portuguese and Essawira uh, <clears throat> has a long history uh, that goes back to the Punic times, to the Phoenicians and the kinship between our people. Uh, the Berber were there, uh, the Phoenicians were there, Mogador, Essawira was a major trading post uh, in about 1200 BC. In fact, by the time it was five or 600 BC, it was a major trading post. And the uh, Phoenician adventurer and traveler, Hanno, H-A-N-N-O. Uh, his history has been memorialized very well by Herodotus in the Periples, Le Periple. So Herodotus wrote about uh, Hanno who circumnavigated the Cape of Gibraltar and went around Africa. They say he could have probably reached Cameroon. So there was a big trading post in Essaouira between Phoenicia, Tyre, which is a big city in Phoenicia, Lebanon today, and Carthage in, uh, uh, in today Tunisia, and Mogador. Why? Because in Essaouira, there are certain things that call les îles purpuriques, the purpuric islands. These islands that you see some of them here and you see the, the uh, Mogador fort, these islands had something very, very precious in antiquity. It's called le murix. It's a shell. It's a very aggressive mollusk shell that uh, secretes a purple dye. The, the purple dye, which was extremely precious. This shell is almost extinct now. And that purple color was so precious that was used to color the tunics of very important people, the emperors, and the name of the Phoenicians Poiniki from the Greeks came from this color, the purple color. And this is why Essaouira was extremely important to the Phoenicians as a trading post. And I will tell you another story, which is really a very good story. How did they trade? So the way they would trade, I am told reading uh, an excerpt from Herodotus, is that the ship would come and they wanted to get those precious things, the shells, the dyes, etc. The ship will, 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 will anchor close to the shore and they will bring gold and they will put them on shore, a certain amount of gold. 
And then the locals will bring the precious goods, uh, textiles, the dye, etc. And they leave. And then the Phoenicians will come back to the shore again and they look how much textile they gave them. And if they like it, compared to the amount of money they were they're willing to pay, they will take everything and they will leave. If not, they'll go back to their ship and it will go back and forth until everybody is satisfied. Nobody took it, nobody stole it. It was completely honest. And you add or you remove, you know, too much, too little. Everybody goes back, the other person comes in. And when everybody is satisfied, the locals will take the money, the Phoenicians will take the goods and everybody goes their own way. That's how trading was done in those days. We can learn from that. This is Essawira today. On the left is a picture I took when I was there. On the right is from the Game of Thrones. This is the same place. Those of you that are aficionados of Game of Thrones, Astapor. And if you remember, they uh, tortured, they uh, crucified, I think, these people here. And of course, this is the cannons. See, the cannons are here, but for the, for the movie, for the series, they covered the cannons. Because of course, there was no cannons in Astapor. So Estawira is also Estapor. Estawira is also a place where there's this amazing festival, uh, Gnawa. Very special music. I love it. It's, uh, it. It goes under your skin. It's just phenomenal, like so many things in Morocco. <laughs> And I was really hoping <laughs> uh, to come this year. And my dear, dear friend and fantastic host, Professor El Abadi, uh, because I could not do it, she invited us to her house and she organized uh, a Ganawa group. It was a memorable evening. Thank you again. We will never forget it. And this is our dean. And this is me that you can use this picture for chantage. And, uh, and this is... Uh, our dear friend, uh, uh, Professor Elabadi Najia. So I uh, would like to uh, commend you for uh, putting this together. I really salute you. Uh, <laughs> us all together, a group of friends and colleagues, and uh, we look forward to continuing this uh, through this medium. I think it's a fantastic medium until today when we, when we meet in person.